So here's some scriptures that talk about biblical solutions to addiction, okay? Just understanding. We have explanation of addiction, description, now solution. Titus 3.3 3 says that the ministry of the Holy Spirit in Christ to an individual is effective over enslaving lust and pleasures of the heart. Remember, this is the passage that said you were, in very, you were enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. And then it said, but then the kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, right? Whom he poured out upon you through the washing and regeneration. He saved us not on works we've done, but through the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ are very central in the, in the solution to what's wrong with our desires and our heart. And that's because these two words, regeneration, re regeneration and renewal, is the answer for the person biblically in addiction. It's the core of it. It's not the only thing. We still have to do this and this. I'm, we have to still radically amputate. We still have to radically replace. But in the middle, we have to have regeneration and renewal. <coughs> 1 Corinthians 6.11 says, Such were some of you. It gives a list of sexual sin. It says, Indicates that past sinful and controlling identities and lust to alcohol was listed there. Sexual pleasures listed in 1 Corinthians 6. Gambling, obsessive thoughts. It can be a thing of the past if you become what? Three words. Washed, sanctified, justified. And then it gives two key people. By Jesus Christ and the Spirit of our God. Right? Those two individuals. It's a person. Romans 6.22 indicates that in Christ you are freed from sin and enslaved to God. And you derive your benefit resulting in sanctification and the outcome, eternal life. In Christ you have been enslaved to God. That's the key. It's not freedom. It's slavery. But it's slavery to the right master. You're not just stopping doing something wrong. You know, you're not just saying, I want to be free. No, I want to be a slave of God. Not just in this area, but more and more progressively in my life. Because he's a good master. Because he knows best and loves most, I will listen to him. Growing in that heart. Galatians 5.16 says, if you walk by the Spirit, you won't carry out those desires of the flesh. Walking by the Spirit and under the Spirit. So realize... We just gave the seed to the rest of this outline. The gospel becomes critical. Believing in Christ, the ministry of Christ to you, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in taking the things of Christ and helping you be not only regenerated, but renewed in those things in place of the flesh and its desires. Ephesians 5.18 even says, uses the word, don't be drunk with wine, but the re big replacement is, yes, be filled with the what? Spirit. See, the Bible is speaking theology here because it's saying the same thing systematically about how to be free from sin through slavery to Christ, through walking by the Spirit, being, as it were, filled with the Spirit. Filled, completely controlled, immersed in his will, his desires. So, what's at the root? Let's talk about the root of addiction. Because it's so important that we expose the deception that's often in the mind. So we have, the, you must stop blaming your addiction on anything other than your self-exalting lust, Right? Your self-exalting lust. And yes, I have those too. And yes, we seek to mortify or put them to death. Number one, the medical model, instead of blaming your desires, will blame the body or the brain. It'll blame the body or the brain. Yet, James 1.13 says, Each one is tempted when he's led away, enticed by his own what? Desires. desires. Not his brain or his body. This is the root. Matthew 4.4 4. Man doesn't live by bread alone. He doesn't live by physical needs. That's pretty strong. If I don't live by getting my physical needs met, then even my desires aren't necessary, right? But I live by every word that comes from God's mouth. My body is a tool, but it's not essential to pleasing God. I don't have to have perfect health. I don't have to have a perfect 
mind, a brain, I can still do the will of God. There's a dependency on God that has to be. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me unless. Is that what we're saying? No. All things God's called me to. Now, let me be quick to say that if you are having a headache and you can take a pill to get rid of the headache to make it easier to be in a good spirit so you don't want the wine, you don't have to take wine, you can take a pill to help you feel better. But to say that if I have a headache and don't have an aspirin, I got to take wine. It's the same way we'd say if I have some kind of brain issue or some kind of body issue and it just caused me to sin, I have a DNA issue or genetic issue, or so, there's something wrong with me, right? Uh, none of those things, those, all those things certainly can contribute. But if we say that's at the root of addiction, well, it's very shallow. We're, we're buying into what we said the first night of our time here together. We're buying into the natural mind's view that we are nothing but a what? A body. That my body made me do it, right? How about there's a psychological model? Blame my what? Past? My parents, my environment. Yet 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13 says what? God will not tempt me beyond what I am what? Able. He's faithful. And Ezekiel 14, 38 says the dad is not responsible for the son's sin. Does he influence it? Yeah. But is he the cause of it? No. Genesis 50, 20 says, my past was meant for good. That's what we get out of that. That's Joseph. Joseph went through some bad circumstances. What, what, what made him stay strong? Because you meant it for evil, he believed, yet God meant it for what? Good. If you believe something about a bad situation and you believe it because the Holy Spirit has persuaded you in your relationship with God that this is 100% to bank on, you can look at that situation in a very different way than someone who has no faith. Your faith is a shield. Remember that. It shields you from the fiery darts of the devil. Without that shield, yet you get hit, and we understand why you do drugs and alcohol or any other sin. But when you raise the shield of faith, I believe I will see the goodness of God in the land of the living. Psalm 27, verse 13. When you raise the shield of faith and the Holy Spirit through the meditation of the Word has convinced you then you have power now through that perspective to be comforted, to see beyond the here and now, to see like Jesus at the joy set before you. So all your circumstances working in some amazing way to get you to a place of needing to believe God more. What if God just set up a bad circumstance for you so that your faith would be refined? We're starting to talk like the Bible now. That's what people need to hear. That's not blame your past. Don't blame your parents. You look to your faith as a replacement to that. Yet, we do want to say, Ephesians 6, 4 says what? Don't provoke your children. That, not because you'll make them sin, but because you are an influence on them. And you will bear the shame or the guilt before God. So I'm a perfect parent. I don't have any problems there with that one. Now that means that we repent. What's, what's worse than sinning against a child is not admitting it and then changing and getting accountability if you need to to change. Don't go it alone, right? So we know that the past can be a contributor. I could spend some time on Exodus 25 because many times we want to delve into this generational curse issue and we could have a whole seminar on that reality. But let's just understand that that thought is saying this. Here's what it's saying. That he shows uh, loving kindness on thousands of generations, right? Uh, it, but he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the third generation, right? Visiting the iniquity, what does that mean? It didn't say anything about generational curse, right? Visiting, did it say causing them to sin? I'm going to tell you what we're saying here. That my dad, in all of his good and bad, the bad that he brought to my life, it does influence me, and it is influencing my kids right now, and their kids will still be influenced. There's a sense in which we're talking to a parent. We're not talking to a child here. Oh, child, 
your dad was a loser, so guess what? God's going to curse you. <laughs> See what I'm saying? This is not the scripture. In fact, God is actually trying to weigh it down, say, I visit those good thousands of generations. So somewhere back in my genealogy, I probably had some good parent, and I'm still being visited good because of them more than I'm being visited bad because of my dad. See how I need to think? God is just putting a warning for parents there. He is not talking to children like, oh, I'm victimized. That is not what he's saying there. Get out of that. I know it sounds exciting. It sounds kind of intriguing. It sounds like, aha, that's what's wrong with you. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> They're enslaved to various lusts and pleasures, and the gospel gives them a new heart and renewal of the mind that can fight that. Right? Ah, put me in that box. But it does contribute. It does contribute. That's the warning to a parent. First, you must stop blaming. The, there's the simplistic Christian model, blame the what? The devil. The devil made me do it. Flip Wilson. Job's endurance. Remember Job's endurance. The devil worked against Job, right, under God's what? Yeah, it wasn't like Job was saying, I'm being victimized by the devil because the devil is simply under the control and parameters of the Heavenly Father. And the Heavenly Father has purposes in your life that are far different from the purposes of the devil. But I'm going to tell you something. The, the Father's purposes are bigger because He's bigger. And the Father's purposes prevail. All you have to do is respond in faith and you will overcome the devil's purposes. Right? And you will actually see that good comes where it would have never happened had the bad never happened. The cross is a symbol of that. Job is a symbol of that. Joseph is a symbol. We can go on and on. Two things are tied together is God's glory and your good if you're his child. So we cannot blame the devil. Off with that. We can't say that. Ephesians 6 says take up the armor so you can resist. So there is something you can do. Take up the armor. Though We talked about that about week four, I think. The disciplines of the Christian life, the prayer, the word, fellowship with other believers. Resist him firm in your faith is all that Ephesians 5 says. It doesn't say he made you sin. It says resist him. Firm in your what? Faith. How do you get faith? Renew the mind. Where did faith start? Regeneration. The first gift given is the gift of faith. And from there you build your life now. And you grow that faith. And it's the victory that will overcome the lust of the flesh. 1 John 5.19, though, does say that the whole world lies under the power of the evil one. Ooh, that sounds scary. It is scary. It's bad. That's to help you stay away from it. There's nothing but death there. It's not to tell you, oh, I'm going to be victimized. It's, you know, no. There's a healthy fear of the devil, but it's not this victimization fear. Romans 12.9 says that, they over, that the devil was hurled to the earth, but they overcame him, verse 12 and 11, by the word of their testimony, they didn't love their life to death. They overcame him as they died. Do you hear what I just said? <laughs> I'm not going to let the devil kill me. Well, you, you may have no choice. God may use your death to save other people. But you're going to overcome the cowardness. You're going to overcome the victimization of that. Oh, I can't believe that's happening to me. God is going to glorify himself in what's happening. Bold statements the Bible makes. The devil is a major contributor. And therefore, we need to be sober. Not sober to feelings that you think, oh, that's the devil making... No. Sober to his deception. He's a master liar. And he'll get you into some really messy theology if you don't open the Bible and study it instead of read too many books. Right? All these things to say, can't blame the devil. The weaknesses of my body, the problems of life, the temptations of the devil may make it harder, but it doesn't make it what? Impossible. That's what we have to hear. It doesn't make it impossible. Um, how I feel does not determine how I act. Wow, that's a news flash, isn't it? <laughs> the, body does, the body does not think. The brain doesn't choose. My parents aren't to blame. The devil didn't make me do it. Though all these powerfully influence choice, it's still my choice. There's still a choice down in all that. God actually intends all bad in your life to cause good. Do you believe this? Because if you don't believe that, then yeah, you're going to keep 
blaming everything else and it's going to just lead you right back into probably drugs and alcohol. You're going to just have self-pity and, uh, and back into... Why do people... We get addicted to things because we define pleasure in them. Maybe it's comfort. And we were talking about food just a little bit ago. We run to food sometimes after a fight with somebody, you know, <laughs> after a stressful day at work. We run to alcohol, same reason, right? What if we learned how to think through that stress in a way that we were comforted by the fact that God has been good to us? How could we complain, right? What if we just had that disposition? I'm going to tell you what thankfulness does. It throws away covetousness. You can't covet for more when you're thankful for what you got. And so you just walk around being thankful. And you'll find that a lot of these idols fall off, right? Uh, a lot of your anger will fall off. A lot of your anxiety will fall off. Thankfulness, I, I've been, the last three weeks God has really impressed upon my heart this idea of thankfulness. And it's, it's one of those themes that I feel like it's going to become what humility has become to me. That if I can learn to be humble and thankful, <laughs> bring it on, right? <laughs> Far too much to be thankful for. But Ephesians chapter 5, verse 3 says that let not sexual immorality or impurity or debauchery or filthiness be named among you, but rather thanksgiving. So these controlling lust, covetousness are put off by gratitude there. You know what the thankful heart has continually? A feast. That's why I'm focusing on that right here. All the bad in my life, God means for good. Be thankful ahead of time. <laughs> Order it. I'm ordering good to come out of this. How are you going to do that? By being thankful right now. Give thanks in what all things, right? First Timothy, First Thessalonians chapter 5. Give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus, right? <coughs> According to biblical thinking, the root of the problem in addiction is not your body, it's not your past, it's not your enemy, the devil, but it is in your heart. Matthew 5, uh, verse 18 through 20. I'm going to read that for you. Matthew chapter 15, sorry. The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and those defile the man. Now listen, verse 19. Out of the heart come evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, slanders, right? So out of the heart come these things. It's the core of us. We can't get away from slavery to sin. Do you see why God would have us see that? Because that would be the, mean that there is absolutely <laughs> zero hope without the gospel through the Holy Spirit and the work of Christ giving you a new heart. If your explanation doesn't put you absolutely dependent upon the work of Christ, you don't get it yet, right? You know what's amazing in my life and maybe in your life? The more I understand how dependent I am on the Lord, the more strong I get. <laughs> how does that work? Because I need the Spirit of God now. Because I need every word that comes from His mouth. I'm not big enough, Dad. What do I need to think here? It's, it humbles me. And that's what people that have addiction need to hear their... They've got to get to this level that it's my heart. Now that we've got it out of the way, let's talk about where we go from there. Letter B, you must see and admit that your problem is between you and God. Your sin, your, all sin is between you and God. And you have on page 164, really what you, I would encourage you to read through. I'm not going to be able to go through all of this. But I want to read a few of these. Look at number one. You were created to be dependent upon God. But you decided to follow your desire for what? Independence. This is a very important, what do we call substance abuse? A dependency issue, don't we? Guide me, comfort me, help me. Isn't that what we say about all our idols? Food. <laughs> Get me through this. <laughs> right? <coughs> Relieve, give me some relief, pain from pain, please. Right? Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, his pain relief, right, was prayer. And the angels came and ministered to him, right? 
That was sweat drops of blood. You haven't yet resisted in your striving against sin to the point of blood yet. You may feel like you've been on the edge of it. Remember uh, the author of the book uh, Psychobabble out there, Richard Gans. It's said that when he used to counsel, he still counsels, but the guy that used to counsel with him used to say, I would always love going by him because when he had someone he had in, sort of in the, in the corner working him over, he'd say, show me the blood. <laughs> show me the blood. You haven't resisted yet because the excuse making. This is your Savior. He does that. But you're dependent upon God for wisdom and for power. And what did you choose to do when you got stress in your life? Your own wisdom and power. <laughs> you say eat, someone said eat, right? Drink and be merry. And look what it says. You foolishly worship and give control of these false gods in place of the one true God. Now prior to the addiction, your challenges didn't victimize you. We already read that. They exposed you though. That's what God said in Deuteronomy 8, 2. I led you through the wilderness so that you would see what was in the heart. See, the deserts of our life, those relationships, they squeeze out what's there so that we can then repent of it. Now, if that stuff never happened, you wouldn't see what was in there, right? It exposed our heart, our rejection of God, our rejection of His help in time of need. By the way, Deuteronomy 8 is written in that very context of what Jesus quoted, man doesn't live by bread alone. I led you in the wilderness, fed you manna, made you hungry, it says there. I, I flipped out when I read that for the first time. I said, oh my goodness, God, you made the children of Israel hungry. I always thought that they just had everything they need every day. No, there was somehow, they were, there were times and days they were not fed. What would you do? You're in the wilderness. You would keep saying, I'm dependent on you, God. If you're getting it right, that's what you'd do. Right? If you don't get it right, you're going to say, going back to Egypt where the idols yes. exist. <laughs> and that's what people that have addiction in it and, and to whatever, and all of us, we get exposed in the deserts. Right? We, don't, we show that we really don't trust God. And that's our problem. We don't know who God is. And number five, it says the challenges of your life only have increased because you worship a God that has been crafted by the destroyer. Can you list some challenges that have increased as a result? The thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. How has he stolen from you, killed things in your life, right, and destroyed you? The, the irony is that you continue to slavishly seek relief from the very thing that deepens your defilement and increases problems in life, all the while God has sent his son to provide a way out and back. It's a worship disorder, number seven. That's what we're dealing with. It's a worship disorder. If you think of it that way, then what do you need to get good at? Worshiping what? God. It puts your knowledge of God and what you do in your mind with God, as with that knowledge of God, and how often you think of God and front and center, right? God, I need to be more dependent and aware of you. Help me, right? These, those that have been into drugs and alcohol can never warm pews again at a church. They must be radically devoted to God, radically replacing Him in, in devotion to Him. They have to be as radical with God as they were with their sin. It has created a need for God in a deeper way. Your thoughts and emotions and behaviors all outweigh are now controlled by the many things and desires that outweigh your desire for God. So what are we saying? Let her see. You must return to God broken and humble through the merits of Christ. Right? You've got to get regeneration. If this is true, then your root problem is not your body, not your brain, or dependence on drugs and sex. That's not the root. It's your proud heart that rejects Christ as what? Your helper? your refuge, your strength, your joy, your God. You don't want Him to give you what He is. You'd rather find it in a substitute. But the Holy God demands that every rebel, every sin be severely punished. He killed His Son to provide payment for your heart rejection. Isaiah 53, 10, right? Our sins He bore. This Holy God, He was crushed for our sin. 
Holy God, you were created for, raised the, the son he had killed to provide power for you, to make you new. Ezekiel 36, I will give you a new heart, put a new spirit in you, cause you to walk in my ways. So he paid the debt you couldn't pay, and he lived the life you couldn't so that he could do what you can't. You're, you're helpless, you're powerless against this sin. You owe a debt on top of it. But if you'll come humble and broken, a broken and contrite heart, Isaiah of Psalm 51 says, he will not what? Despise. In fact, a broken and contrite heart are the sacrifices of God. You don't make up for that by making up for that. You make up for that by admitting, I'm broken. I need help. I, I throw up myself upon the rock instead of let the rock crush me. I break on the rock. So, underline in that, but if you'll come humble, broken, by faith in Jesus as your new Savior and Lord, those two words are critical. You can receive from Him a new record, a new heart, a new master, a new helper, a new ability to know God. These are promises in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. If any man is in Christ, he's a what? It's a new creature. That means the potential is there. The heart is there now. The soil is fertile. It's ready. Now let's put some new thoughts in there. Let's put some dependent prayers in there. Let's get some fellowship around that. Let's give a whole new way of living now. Repentance. The rest of John MacArthur said that the Christian life begins as a beggar and continues as a beggar. <laughs> we never get to the place where, it, oh, I'm over from begging. I don't need any help anymore, God. And in fact, the more you grow, the more dependent you are on God. Your solution is all about a relationship with Jesus. Turn from your sin. Turn from your attempts to fix yourself, make up for your sin, and just humble yourself. The hardest thing for a proud man to do is humble himself because his greatest desire is to exalt himself. I want to look good. Sorry. You're going to come to Jesus. You're going to have to admit you're pretty ugly. You okay with that? No, I would rather try to fix this myself. Surrender to him as the master and owner of all things you claim as yours. Your body, your time, your possessions, your money, your abilities, your marriage, your children. You and all you have been given exist for the pleasure of him who knows best and loves most. Your ability to be free is not found in following a program, but a person. All things laid at the feet of Christ. Lord Jesus Christ. So the key question then would say, would be, do you believe that he's worthy to be in control of you? You'll rise and fall on that thought in your obedience. That's what it is. It's who's, who's going to control me? Am I going to listen to myself? Am I going to let him convince me that he's worthy to be in control? The Holy Spirit is in the job of convincing you that you're broken and that Jesus is Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3. You know what it says? No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And Romans 10, 18, 10, 8, 9 says, unless you confess with your mouth, Jesus is what? Lord, and believe in your heart, you can't be what? Saved. So the Holy Spirit persuades you through the Scripture that Jesus is Lord. He's worthy. He knows best. He loves most. He died for you. That changes an, a person that's enslaved to drugs and alcohol or whatever it is, their orientation to this now. Okay, so now I have two lords. Now I have a, a spiritual comprehension that's deeper than just my brain that I belong to this Lord and I can pursue this now. It's not just about, hey, don't you want to make something of your life? And it's not just about, hey, think of your kids. All that is secondary and important to put in the picture, but the biggest issue is Jesus is Lord. You ain't getting away from him, and you know that because you're saved. Now let's just stop the fight. He's going to win, right? Let's submit to him as Lord. And if you were to look at um, Luke 14, there Jesus says basically this. Listen to the hard sayings. He says that if, if any of you doesn't give up Hate, hate his wife and mother and brother and his own life more than me, uh, for me. He cannot f be my disciple. This is 
This is a moment of change. This is the hard sayings of Jesus. I mean, here's the crowd coming to him. Wouldn't you try to make it easy for them to follow you if you were Jesus? No, because you wouldn't know who the Spirit really was regenerating or not. If I make the call of salvation, oh, hey, you know, this Lord thing, we'll get to that later. Let's just talk about forgiveness. Don't you want to be forgiven? Don't you want to feel good? Get rid of your shame? This is important stuff, what I'm saying. Yes, the gospel is about justification. But if I conceal from them this statement of Jesus to the multitudes, hey, guys, this is not going to be just like churchianity. This is going to be lifestyle. Look, you're turning from sin, not to self-righteousness, but to Christ. And you're receiving all that Christ has. You, 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 don't turn to, you, you don't obey to get saved, but you obey because the Spirit has shown you something about Jesus. And I, Jesus was simply, as it were, in the garden, seeing what fruit was ripe. And the, and the fruit that the Holy Spirit had made ripe would respond to the call that said this, listen, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own dad, that's easy. No, it's not about that. It's about in comparison to me. Dad, mother, wife, children, brothers, sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, okay, how about this? I'll just take the justification, not the discipleship thing. You think that's going to work with Jesus? Oh, okay. You know, just keep quoting Ephesians 5 or Ephesians 2.8. Saved by grace, that's all I need to know. Now, there, there's something more about grace teaches you to deny ungodliness, Titus chapter 3. It's not that it saves you. It teaches you. Grace doesn't save you by good works. It teaches you to do good works because it shows you something that's more valuable than the here and now. G John MacArthur wrote a book, uh, mm, must have been 50 million years ago. Now it's called uh, The Gospel According to Jesus. I don't know if you know, that was a huge debate I'm about to say something that's going to shake people. Anyway, he wrote that book, The Gospel According to Jesus, because there was this thing called easy believism that was going on, where the call to salvation wasn't a call to Jesus. It was a call to something simply called forgiveness. And that's really what we still have in some ways. A call to Jesus is he justifies your sin, and now you're his. That's a good thing. And you can be free from sin. That's a good thing if you're saved, right? But if you don't understand this, are you saved? And so he went through the Gospels and said, here's Jesus' call to the unconverted, to the sinner. And it was hard things like this, hard things like this, where others had said that the Gospel was what Paul said, that there was no uh, action, there was no submission to the Lordship of Christ. And so MacArthur took issue with this. And you know who started attacking him? Some of your favorite preachers. And I won't tell you the names of them. You can research it yourself online, okay? How's that sound? I never let it be said that I attacked anybody. But the point being that the gospel here, Jesus is calling the addict to something radical, the person that was enslaved to something bigger. So returning to God, new Savior and Lord, not just uh, doing pew warming, do you believe he's worthy to be in control? So here are the choices that we talk to people about. Look at these questions. Do you believe Jesus is Savior and Lord? What of the following things do you still claim as yours and are not believing he's more worthy of and to be in control of? Freedom to use time as I choose. So you want to get very specific. Freedom to have and use money as I choose. Possessions as I choose. Hang out where I choose. Companions as I choose. Money as I choose. Live where I choose. Even work where I choose. The more we employ our freedom of choice, the more we become slaves of our choice, right? Humility before God is the key to your freedom. And these are the passages on humility here of James 4. So this is the beginning. Regeneration. This is to help someone hear the call of the gospel. It is not work salvation, but it is a Savior who is Lord. The Holy Spirit opening your eyes to confess Him as Savior and Lord, to see Him as worthy, that He knows best and loves most. 
This, last, this next section is about addiction as a life dominating sin. There are some consequences that have come as a result of loving your sin more than loving Christ. And you can see this. God uses a label sometimes called, uh, it dominates these labels on your life, homosexuality, drunkenness. Those are labels. That is a practice, a lifestyle of sin. It's dominating you. And you can see this circle. This wheel, as it were, t your time, your thoughts, your body, your relationship, everything is affected by the worship of this thing as well as uh, it's getting the consequences of the worship of those things. So at the bottom of that page 166, it says at the bottom, use the wheel illustration above. Can you list a few examples in each sphere of life, how your idol controlled and brought bad consequences to that area of life? That helps them think through how that this is an addiction. Let's go to the, the last section here, 168. So we're going to go ahead and now explain some of the specifics. You know, the world has steps, right? And those steps can be useful. They kind of mirror some of the biblical themes. So let's just give four steps. What do you say? And we're going to give four steps here in understanding how to gain freedom. But we're going to understand it in light of gaining slavery, through, through slavery. So we're, we're not going to blame anything other than our self-exalting lust, other than yourself, you could write, and your self-exalting lust. Page 168, you can see and admit that the root of your problem is your rejection, hostility toward God, you return humbly through the merits of Christ, and you live under that new Savior and Lord mentality. You grow in what regeneration has convinced you is true, that Jesus is the Christ and He is the Lord. And now renewal of the mind takes that truth and increases your understanding of it. And in practical ways, how do I live that out? Why do I live that out? So a, a key verse there at the top of your page 168 is Romans 6, 19 through 22. Just look there at verse 22. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become what? Slaves of God. Just underline that thought in verse 22. How do we get free from sin? By becoming what? Slaves of God. So the more that my time, my money, my thoughts all reflect slavery to God's thoughts, God's way of using that, the more free I am from what? That which is killing me. See the, see the irony of this. The devil promises freedom, gives slavery. God promises slavery and gives freedom. <laughs> you see? The sun sets us free. Now, you must begin a radical relationship of learning to let the Spirit of Jesus be in absolute control. It's the same thing as the Lordship of Christ, following of Christ. Um, you must begin that. If Jesus is not worthy of your absolute surrender, like it said in Luke chapter 14, how long is he going to sit on the throne making choices? You see the battle? The battle is to keep Christ in your mind as worthy delighting yourself in Him, right? And it does get easier as you go along because what? You start tasting and seeing that what? That it is good. But the person that has an addiction has tasted and seen not that, but they have tasted and seen that their idol is not good. <laughs> so by faith in the work of Christ, they can move forward in that renewing of their understanding of Christ as worthy. Being controlled by the Spirit of God is the key replacement to any life-dominating sin. Ephesians 5.18, do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. So you put off wine, and then you are do nothing, right? No, you put on being filled with the Spirit, under the control of the Spirit. How are you to be under the control of the Spirit? Let's all try to be under the control of the Spirit. Ready? Here we go. Okay. 
No, we're talking about your thoughts. What are you thinking? Are you thinking spiritual thoughts? Where do you get those? The Bible. How do you get those into your meditation? Work, right? Prayerful work. So I've got to go through the day radically committed to the Word of the Spirit and the actions that the Spirit would have me do. I have to figure the wisdom out. What do you want me to, how do you want me to handle this conflict, Lord? How do you want me to handle the fact that the employee didn't give me a promotion, the boss didn't give me a promotion? I'm not going to have self-pity. How do I give thanks? How do I look beyond the here and now? Right? Be filled with the Spirit. Key replacement. The Spirit must control your thoughts and actions in every area of your life, just like the things you're addicted to do now, yet producing very different results in your life than your former addiction. This is so key. The fruit of the Spirit is what? Love and joy and peace. And let's stop there for a minute. Could you get that from a bottle? You can get an imitation, can't you? Can you get that from food? Sure. Don't you feel a sense of... You can get a sense of that. What you can get is you can get it in your bloodstream, right? Get it your physical senses, but you can't get it in your spiritual reality, in the core of who you are. Your heart can't really taste love and joy and peace. Your body can only. That's the problem with substance abuse, right? You're, you're just getting it body deep. Where the Holy Spirit, being spirit, can help you feel and enjoy the truth of love, joy, and peace, and get you to live that out in your thoughts, in your actions. What's the rest of the fruit of the Spirit? Stuff that usually goes out the window when something other than the Spirit is in control. Patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, that means consistency, and self-control. See, when you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, you gain more self-control under Him. You actually have a choice. Will I do good? I do have the option of good. Without the Spirit, you don't have the option. You just react. So the Spirit must be in control of your thoughts and actions. That's what our goal is. We've got to help the person understand that's what it means to be filled with the Spirit. The Spirit indwells you at the moment of rebirth to assure that your process in of growth in Christ, winning the war against your flesh, you can become more like Him. Some people don't understand that that is the mission of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians chapter 1. Paul says there that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Sealed. Not a seal that just sits there and says, whatever you want to do is fine. I'll be here when you need me. Right? And just kicks back. No. It's an active seal. You know what the Spirit is really good at? Helping you comprehend God. How do I know that? What did Paul pray? Ephesians chapter 3, I pray that out of his spirit you may be strengthened, that you may be comprehend the love of God. Paul, Ephesians chapter 3. What did Paul pray in Ephesians 1.17? I pray that your eyes may be enlightened, <coughs> right? That you might know the hope of your calling, the riches of his inheritance. I pray that you may have the spirit of wisdom and revelation that you may know Jesus better. So see, the Holy Spirit's ministry to us isn't just to zap us, okay? Did I just feel the Spirit or not? I'm not sure. Are you comprehending how valuable Jesus is by your study of the Word? Are you delighting in Him? Do you have the ability to delight in Him over food, over drugs? Do you have that ability to have joy come from the inside into the bloodstream instead of attempt to get it from the bloodstream into you, right? The Holy Spirit indwells us. Let me give you some scriptures to understand this. John 3, 5. If you're not born of the Spirit, you can't enter the kingdom of God, right? It's regeneration. John 14, 16. I will ask the Father, and he'll give you another helper. I will come to you in that, his form. And Romans 8, 2, and verse through 6, says that the law of the Spirit has set us free from the law of sin and death. The ministry of the Spirit is to keep us holy, in other words, to help us. And it goes on to say in verse uh, 5, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who are according to the Spirit set their mind on the things of the what? Spirits. You know what a mindset is? It means that you're thinking of it so much that it keeps invading your thoughts. 
Does it sound like what you do with maybe substances, food, and that sort of thing? So now the Holy Spirit is so much mastering your thoughts that you say, I'm thinking like the Spirit right now. I look at the good that's going to come out of this. I'm thankful. I'm overflowing with melody, as it says in Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Spirit and be thankful and sing with hymns and songs and spiritual songs. He's so in charge of me that I have the fruit of the Spirit, the mindset on the flesh are these things. And I already said 1 Corinthians 12, 3, that no one can say Jesus is the Lord except by the Holy Spirit. And Ezekiel 20, 36, 25, these are all listed there for you, says that I will clean you from all your idols, remove the heart of stone from you, and put my spirit in you to cause you to walk in my ways, to give you a new heart, a new ability to love and to fear and to trust at a new level, the potential because of the Spirit in you. Hold on just a second. John 16, 14 says this. The Holy Spirit will glorify me. You want to know the mission of the Holy Spirit? Put this over top. Holy Spirit will glorify Jesus because here's how he'll do it. He'll take what is mine, Jesus, and make it and disclose it to you and help you, in other words, to comprehend it, to know it. So if Jesus had died on the cross... It did nothing. He did nothing unless the Holy Spirit helped us understand what he did. It's the same way when we read the Bible, guys. Unless the Holy Spirit illuminates our mind, we can't understand these things. But we do have to use our mind. See? As our prayer is, God, show me. I'm after not just getting free from addiction. I'm after the Spirit disclosing the things of Christ to me to help me comprehend more of his worthiness because my idol is screaming out, come to me and I'll help you instead of God, instead of Christ. So the Spirit indwells us at the moment. It, the Spirit gives us ability to comprehend the value of Christ so that we can fight the deception that sin brings to us and the desire brings to us. That's why Romans 8, 12, and 13 if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So it's by the Spirit's truth as he discloses this. Um, if I were to put an equation out for you, I'd say Christ's work plus the Spirit's illumination, Christ's work plus the Spirit's illumination equals salvation. And I would say the same thing. Christ's word plus the Spirit's illumination equals power to obey. You take one of those out, you take the Word out, you just have the Spirit. You take the Spirit out, you just have the Word. You put Jesus' Word and the Spirit together, you have power to obey because you can comprehend. Now your 80 years on earth looks like a vapor. It's an important vapor. Eternity looks bigger and better. Matthew chapter 5, verse 27 here, right? We, we know under, understand radical amputation, how important that is in overcoming sin. And here we have regeneration and renewal. Titus chapter 3, verse 3, all the way down to verse 7. That's one of the verses for this track you can memorize, by the way. It helps you remember the importance of renewal and regeneration, Titus chapter 3. In overcoming enslaving lust and pleasure, I must have the regeneration and ongoing renewal of the Holy Spirit who's poured out Jesus Christ on me, His love. Radical replacement, Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45. Matthew chapter 12, verse 43 to 45. It, Jesus gives an analogy that can be applied here. He said, when an evil spirit leaves a person, it looks for somewhere to find home. And it comes back to where it started. And it finds the home neat, swept, put in order, rehab center. <laughs> But here's the word, unoccupied, not replaced. And so then it, the last state becomes worse than the first. See, we don't just do this. We help them re get through this and radically replace key priorities in their life. So all those, those three things I hope you see are all through what we taught here tonight in overcoming addiction. And the, and the key replacement 
requires two people, Jesus Christ, work on the cross, plus the Spirit's illumination. It requires the word of the Spirit, plus the Spirit's power. And that's going to come together in a schedule and come together under the Spirit's shepherds in your life. They have to commit, see those things. They have to see those things, and you have to move towards those things as their, as their helper in this, right? All right, let me pray for you all as we close, okay? Lord, we've covered a lot of ground in this big topic, and I pray that we will simply learn how to think of these key pieces and add to these, uh, use these key concepts to keep growing and understanding of how to be free through slavery to Christ as the Spirit of God takes the things of Christ and discloses them to us, reveals, illuminates our mind as we think on His Word and as we do what He calls us to do in life. Teach us more about this, God, as we live our own enslavement to various lusts and pleasures and find the grip of those things less and less as the grip of your love in our life and desire for you grows. So I thank you for your help in our life. Pray now we'll go and be able to use this for your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.